go. I'm very ready. Going live. Hello, everyone. Going to give everyone a moment. We had a couple of little glitches before we we're getting started here. So apologize for being a few minutes late, but we're going to let everybody kind of log in for a minute. Get everything rolling. Um, looks like everything is working good. As you're logging in today, just want to remind you that this is the net effect. Um, I'm Robin Jones, director of the ABF Career Alliance, and this is episode 28. Um, at, and this is um, the way that we move forward in throwing the net on the right side. So we're going to get moving. And um, I think I think our Facebook Live is going. Everything's going so good. So if you can't see me and our wonderful guest, Mr. John Butler, then you probably need to download um, the Zoom app and so that you can participate in our Q&A today. Uh, the chat has been disabled because we're going to use Q&A. So please open your Q&A. You go to that little toolbar and it says Q&A. Uh, click on that and type in your name and where you're from uh, so we can kind of get an idea if everything's working there and see who's all with us today. So thank you, Sally. appreciate you doing that. Bill, thank you. Good. Jan. Hi, Jan. Nice to hear from you down there in Rio Rancho. Uh-huh. Judith. Thank you, Judith. Appreciate you being here. Hey, Gabe. Good. Super, super. There's Jeff, our buddy, Jeff Scott. He's down there listening, John. Just wanted you to know that. Yeah, good. So it looks like everything's working fine. So without further ado, I would like to welcome our special guest today, my friend, my former teammate, uh, John Butler. Welcome, John. Thank you, Robin. John and I met years ago at Principia College. Uh, like I said, we, were played, we played football together, teammates. It was, a, it was a wonderful opportunity to, to, to get to know new people and, you know, kids coming from all over the country. Um, and, and that's where John and I met. Um, and we've been friends ever since. Um, just a little background. John uh, is a terrific athlete. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. But uh, right now, he is vice president of sales at Anuva Capital. Uh, John started in the mortgage banking business right pretty much out of college, a few years doing a few things. We're going to talk about that, so I don't want to steal the thunder, but uh, he's just been a, a successful and, and wonderful businessman for a long time. And um, I, I want to kind of start with the journey of, of why you chose Principia College out of all places. Um, <laughs> yeah, what, what, what kind of led you to, to pick this little college on the bluffs of the Mississippi? Well, I, you know, initially when I answered those questions in the past, it was because of, uh, it was the financially best way for me to go. Coming from a family that uh, we weren't poor by any means, but we did not have a lot of additional cash. Um, school at Principia with grants and loans was almost free. Um, you know, I was able to play football. I was able to run track. If I wanted to play basketball, I, I, I could have done that. But uh, as I've grown and I've matured, um, Principia was my blessing. Um, my mother had that divine ear going and it was a place I was supposed to be to grow independently, to grow spiritually, and to grow athletically, because uh, it, it allowed me to be, basically be a fresh start. And that's, that's really what happened. It chose me. I didn't choose it. I mean, you were looking at other schools, right? I mean, you had, you had a list. I mean, there are other. Yeah, I had gotten accepted to uh, UC Davis, um, uh, Pitt University, University of Pennsylvania, where is where I really wanted to go. Um, but uh, as you know, that's not a very uh, reasonably priced school. And uh, I did not have any financial aid to be able to attend there. So I ended up with Principia College. And I don't regret it. Yeah, why do you say that? Um, I get to meet people like you and Jeff Scott. <laughs> right. 
I mean, I, I grew up a lot. I mean, we all grew up together. I, it's, it's uh, again, it's, it was an opportunity for me to grow spiritually again. Um, I'd never been in a full immersed, fully immersed uh, environment other than home, obviously. But the like-mindedness of, of the college and, and the students. I mean, we've seen some things just on the football field that I tell people about today that nobody would ever believe as far as manifestations of healings and oh God, <laughs> and stuff like that. Well, here's um, something you'd never believe either, right? Um, seeing this, seeing this young man stretching out. Yeah, well, we had fun. We had fun. Had a good track team that we had great coaches and we had great athletes that are on the track. And so it was nice. It was nice. And we represented well. I don't think, I think every year I was there, we won the conference in track and field, men and women, men and women. So yeah, no, I, well, and you started to talk about the healing um, component of things that you witnessed and saw as an athlete. I know that um, I coached in the area uh, where Prynne is, and and some of the coaches that I coached with, this is when I was in Alton, uh, were at Greenville and Illinois College, and you know they all they they all played against us, and and they would, and all of them to the to the to the man said it was amazing to watch what what you guys did. He said there somebody go down, and then people would come around and they you know move him off the field, and three plays later be back in the game. So it's pretty remarkable, really. Um, and I think I completely concur with what you're saying, you know. Um, so so here, here's another picture I dug out of the kind of the archives, John Butler. You were all conference. I was a senior and you were a junior. You were all conference that year. Um, yes, I was. And, and you really, I mean, you were, you were stalwart on our team. And t- tell me what it was like for you coming into a, the college and, and playing, you know, starting and being a part of, of, of the team. What, what was that like for you coming in from California? Um, the speed of the game was not too much. Um, what got me my first year, probably year and a quarter, um, I was a little scared rabbit. I mean, I had, you know, people like Joel and, 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 and other teammates that just put their arms around me. Athletically, I felt I, I could handle it. Mentally, I wasn't ready. That was my biggest adaptment or adaptation for this from high school to college. Um, my sophomore year and especially my junior year, um, that was behind me. But the coming from you know a large high school in California, you know where we were playing Division One athletes every day. Mm-hmm. The adjustment to the speed of the game wasn't wasn't difficult at all, but the mental part of it, feeling that I belonged, feeling that I was good enough, feeling that I was, you know, strong enough, fast enough, athletic enough. Um, I take the last one back. I always felt I was athletic enough, but the other parts definitely weighed heavily on me, and uh, you know, I luckily I had some very good teammates to help me understand you know, that I belonged. And I adapted to that. But that, you know, again, that's part of the love of print and the love of being an athlete. I don't think uh, you can replicate that anywhere else in the world. Um, athletes, they, we bond, we go through it together. And, you know, we got each other's back. Hello, high water. We got each other's back. So that was a beautiful part about it. So you took some pretty good, um, pretty good things away from there, right? In terms of fellowship, brotherhood, and um, growth and maturity. Oh, 100%. 100%. I mean, you know, you come in as a, as a freshman, uh, you know, from, you know, a big program and you realize you got to start over all again. And that's good. That's humbling. You know, where you might think you're a big fish in a small pond, you realize you're just a fish. But your family are other fish that support you and, and bring you through it and help you grow and help you mature because um, they're counting on you day in and day out, every play. Um, and that's, I mean, that's the biggest thing from athletics. And it replicates life the same way. Um, you know, where, where you work, it's the same thing. 
your family during the day at work is your work family. You know, sports are the same way. It's a, it's a perfect parallel and uh, it prepares you for the future for sure. So tell us about how you got discovered. Um, if, if, if no one, if, if to just kind of back up, John, aren't you the only Principia College football player that's ever been drafted or, or, or is that, is that the right term or gone into the NFL? I mean, I'm, I'm not quite sure what, if that's true or not true, but, but tell us about how you got discovered by the NFL. Um, they, we had a teammate named uh, Will Hagenlocker, who was just a specimen of person, love him to death. And he had all the accolades of any Division I athlete. He was big and he was fast. He was agile. And they were coming to look at him. And uh, I guess, humbly speaking, they saw this, you know, six foot one, six foot two guy running around the field that was fairly fast, could jump and, you know, was moving around pretty well. And they said, well, who's that other kid? And at the time, IJ was our coach. And uh, he said, well, he's, he's one of our athletes on this thing. He's, you know, He's a, a dual sport athlete and, you know, long, long, long story short is uh, I took a, a test as uh, I forgot what the name of the test is. It'll come to me, but it was a written test. And, uh, Wonderlic uh, test. The Wonderlick. That's it. Mm -hmm. I scored from what IJ says extremely well on it. One of the highest in the nation at the time. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they, you know, checked in in track season in my junior year. And that's when, you know, I'd broken a couple records and done a couple of things and the rest was history. They came out my senior year. I ran a couple forties for them. And next thing you know, they were calling me on a regular, on a regular basis. Wow. Um, kind of exciting. I mean, I got to think that's pretty exciting, right? Oh, I was in heaven. I was in heaven. And, and, you know, and that, and, and there were several team interested in you, right? Four very interested between the Cowboys, um, the Niners, uh, let's see, New Orleans, and uh, the fourth, I believe, was the Jets. Ah. Jets or the Giants. Yep. Well, you 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 landed in a pretty good place, I think. I mean, the 49ers at the time were um, pretty good, and that that year in 1987, you were a part of a team that went 13 and two. Um, pretty pretty awesome stuff john to, to think about that and and then here's your here's kind of your uh here's where you were at that point in your life you know um making, <laughs> <laughs> <you're right>. yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right six one See, those numbers pounds. <laughs> yeah and they might have given you a few on that one um, no i was i was actually yeah. playing at 205 did you wow that's good yeah, I, yeah that's terrific you yeah. so I mean, what was it like to put the uniform on for the first time and, and kind of walk out of the locker room and you're, you're standing there and you're seeing guys get, get dressed out and, and here you are putting on, putting on the red and gold? Well, it, you know, it started before that, Robin, to be quite honest. I, uh, they had mini camp back in those days and I, mini camp was at the same time as nationals. I couldn't go to nationals because I was going to mini camp, so I had to make that choice. Ah. Um, but getting to the camp and you know, just sitting there, and we weren't full dressed at that time. Going to the locker room, my locker was directly next to my idol, who was Ronnie Lott. Oh wow! And my second day there, Ronnie was there for treatment, and he just happened to come down, and I look up. And I'm just getting dressed to go out. And Ronnie was coming out. And he, it was, I was like a kid in a candy store. My eyes were just like they had to be just about the size of a of a plate. Right. And he said, Hey, Rook. And that's all he said. I could have died and gone to heaven then. <laughs> so right. we were off to practice. We just off to practice. And at that point, you know how it is when you strap it up, it's time to go. I mean, did you feel like coming from a tiny school like Principia, Division Three? I mean, did you feel like you belong there? You know, it's weird. At minicamp, I did not. You know, and I, there was a lot of chatter. Yeah, you're going to get cut. 
uh, you don't, you know, this and that. There was a lot of that chatter, but. So you had to face worked. some adversity there too. I mean, there's a little bit but yeah. from, from my own people, from the yeah. print people. Huh. However, I had uh, worked out those last two years with a lot of guys that were division one. And, uh, you know, one of them actually was there in San Fran with me. And, uh, you know, it, I got to the point in the summer before we reported to camp. And I started to realize they were no bigger, they were no faster, they knew the game better, but uh, athletically I could do everything they could do. And I started to believe it. And uh, first week, still there. Second week, still there. We go to the first game, come back, I'm still there. Second preseason game, come back. They would cut everybody else around me, still there. You know, the third preseason game, you know, is where I got released. And then the strike happens, and I got a call from uh, Ray Rhodes. He says, you in shape? I said, yes, sir. They brought me back, and the rest was history. I mean, here you are. I, mean, this, I, I, can't, I, I had forgotten how big this dude was, Fuller. I mean, he's a big dude, man. I mean, that's a monster of a player, and there you are playing with him side by side. Jeff Fuller is the best specimen of a, a defensive back I've ever seen in my life. Oh, he, unbelievable. He was 6'2", 6'3", 230 pounds. He was fast. He uh, could hit like a Mack truck. Um, he was a specimen of a man. He would have been first ballot Hall of Famer had he not gotten injured. No yeah. doubt. Yeah. He was a specimen. He, he really would have been. So here you are getting coached by Bill Walsh. You're covering Jerry Rice. Not by the well. way, these are, these are all <laughs> – these are all guys that – you know, are, are legends in the NFL and are in the Hall of Fame. And you're covering Dwight Clark in practice. And um, that's pretty remarkable uh, for, from a guy coming from a small college. Uh, how, how did you feel your knowledge of the game was? I mean, do you feel like you had some pretty good foundation? I had a lot of catching up to do. That was my biggest challenge. Yeah. That was my biggest challenge. Their defensive playbook was 587 pages. Unbelievable. Defensive playbook. You know, so the good thing I had is that I had fairly good instincts for the ball. And even though I messed up often because my instincts were there, I was able to recover. Yeah. And I made plays um, and I was in locations that I probably shouldn't have been. But again, blessed, knock on wood. And I had some athleticism and I was often in the right place. So you're, you're, this is you, this is a bad picture, but um, I, I, I tried to capture a few things from some video, which made it a little bit challenging, but right, this right. is you in an Atlanta versus an Atlanta um, Falcon team. And, um, and you're playing and you're pursuing like, a, 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 and it looks like you're moving pretty good. I mean, you look pretty good out there on the field. Yeah, speed wise, Robin, no, no false modesty. I athletically belonged. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to say that I didn't, and maybe it's my ego. Um, the speed of the game was, yeah, definitely faster. The guys are bigger, they're faster, they're stronger. Um, but I adapted quickly, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to say I was an all pro, but I believe if it were a different team, Mm -hmm. a different team I might have made remember that team had three all pros in the defensive back, back yeah. it, it, and and several that would go on you know like Ronnie Lott's got Hall of Fame oh you know I mean those guys are really good um, great so you actually played through the strike season um yeah. and then they brought and but a lot of guys I noticed were playing like Fuller and I saw Montana playing and Dwight Clark came back. So you were playing with a lot of first team guys. Well, let me give you a list. And this is for anybody who knows uh, football. Joe Montana. He was on the team. Um, Steve Young. Jerry Rice. Roger Craig. Tom Rathman. Um, that's just on the offensive side. Uh, Dwight Clark. Um, geez. Uh, Russ Francis. Um, geez, I mean, the list goes on. Defensively, we had Ronnie, we had Keena Turner, we had Charles Haley, 
Michael, Curtis, you had Michael Carter, I, who I um, went against in track in high school. Yeah, that was exactly. a bad dude too, man. Michael Carter was an, uh, at six feet, three hundred pound. He could jump up and grab a basketball rim and hang on it. I, I remember when he was throwing the shot put at a meet over in Dallas, and everybody would throw, and Michael was just kind of hanging out, chilling with everybody. Right. And then, and then he would decide to throw and he'd just throw 10 feet farther than everybody else. You know, he's just amazing guy. He's that explosive. Well, remember he had made the Olympic team. Yeah, I know. I mean, he was, I mean, he, he, he broke the state high school throwing record when he was in high school um, that had been for like 30 years. He, he was incredible. Oh, he, he was. And, and the list goes on. There yeah. are so many guys out there on those fields that are just some of the most amazing athletes you've ever seen in your life even Joe Montana I mean we were goofing around one time and Joe was shooting baskets you know we were you know doing one of those like uh, festival type things where you shoot Joe had a stroke let me tell you Joe could stroke it yeah you know so these guys were amazing they, they really were it, and it's a real testament John to the fact that you got selected and you played and you played in all those strike games and um, I know um, once that once the strike ended and everybody kind of came back, um, what what happened then? Uh, I was actually there one day after the strike, and I practiced one day with them, and then the next day I came back and they said, uh, "Well, my locker was clear, oh. and when your locker's empty, you know that's the writing on the wall." Um, but they brought me in. They said, "Hey, we really like you. Um, we wish there was a way we could keep you." Um, but you know, things happen for a reason. And uh, even up to the playoff game, they, you know, I actually was going to, I almost resigned before the playoff came because they had an injury. Um, they ended up getting somebody with some experience, but that's how, how much they kept in contact with me. So did you try to, I mean, you, I, I think you tried to pursue and continue on with, with trying to find a way back in the NFL. What was that like? I did. I tried. I, uh, I actually got hurt that, uh, that year messing around playing ball with some of our print friends. Ah. And, uh, the day before I was to sign with the Rams, um, and I had to tell them what transpired. They, uh, they basically said, uh, we're going to pass at this time because yeah. of the injury. It was a knee injury. So, so you were, uh, you had to get a real job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. But you still, there were still other opportunities that kind of came down the pike, right? I mean, there were other possibilities. I made two teams uh, for upstart leagues. One was uh, uh, a world league that I believe was backed by Donald Trump or somebody like that. But uh, that folded before I was supposed to go to camp. Um, and then uh, there was another league that uh, was a startup and it folded before um, the league got started. But I'd made two teams. Uh, two to three years after that. So um, once you were kind of done with uh, football, um, what made you, what, where did you go from there? I went into mortgage banking. Ah. Yeah, I went into mortgage banking. I worked for about a year, year and a half at Nordstrom's, um, which allowed me to still work out, stay in shape, um, earn a little bit of money. Um, you know, and do the things that I, I needed to do in my mind to still be a professional athlete. Um, and then it, towards the end of that, uh, where things started, you know, tailing off, was getting old, and I was not seeing the, the light at the end of the tunnel, um, or I was seeing it, I went into mortgage banking. And that's when I started in 19, late 1988. And so why mortgage banking? And, and, and your experience up until that point um, was that an asset for you? Yeah, well, you know, I always wanted to make money. Yeah. Um, and uh, I met a couple very well-dressed, well-spoken young men that were driving great cars and, you know, spending money at Nordstrom where I met them and uh, doing on the outward what I thought to be quite well. And I gave it a shot. And 30 years later, I was still doing it. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I know you love I know you love people and working with people and um, that must have appealed to you as well. Yeah, that, that was huge. Um, 
I, I that and it was an office structure, but you're always out and about and you're meeting people and you're helping them fulfill their goals. And, you know, it, it's, it's a lot of, it, it fit my personality. Right. I got a chance to talk and laugh and joke and be silly and do networking things and all the stuff that I, I really come to find out that was part of my soul um, was the mortgage industry was based on a lot of team play, you know, a lot of teamwork, um, helping others to be successful. You know, a lot of that was, uh, there was a direct correlation to what transpired in college for sure. In college yeah. athletics. Well, um, you know, I, I, I thought this would be a really good opportunity to talk about what's been happening in, in the workplace as it relates to um, racism. It, you know, it's a tough topic for a lot of folks, um, but um, I think it's something that's important to continue the conversation. And so I, I thought it would be great to, to get your feedback and kind of get your thoughts of, you know, what, what, what have you seen as it relates to racism in your own professional career? Have you, have you had some of those challenges? Oh, I'm sure I have. It, it, it's, it may not have been uh, direct and overtly, you know, pointed at me. Um, but uh, there are occasions, situations that I'm sure were directed to, you know, between nepotism and racism. Um, you know, remember as a African-American and in, a, in, in some of the arenas that I dealt with, I'm sure they felt that, you know, I was less than as far as intelligence wise or or ability wise, because, you know, I was an athlete. I'm not, I'm a black athlete at that. I'm not supposed to be halfway intelligent or halfway well-spoken. Um, the one that sticks out the most to me is when right before the market crashed, I was working for a company that I was to be um, one of the individuals to be promoted and then get a piece of the, we'll just say a piece of the action when the company uh, was acquired by the, the, the buying company. When I was training a young man who unbeknownst to me was um, the nephew of one of the big wigs. Uh, he took the job that I was told I was going to be promoting into um, and basically got a piece of the action when the company was sold. And this was a company that I helped build um, to a certain extent. Um, and help us really grow to the level we were at. And here comes a kid that's fresh out of college, frat boy, because um, he knew the right person, took the job that I everybody told me that I deserved. Now, I'm sure that everybody knew about this because behind closed doors, it had to have been in play. Um, whether it was racism, nepotism, or a little bit of both, I was very hurt and jaded because I, you know, I'd given these people my all, and I deserved that position, in my humble opinion. Um, but uh, I didn't get it. And then when uh, I refused to do this young man's work for him anymore, uh, that's when they said, "Well, I'm no longer of service to them," and they let me go. So, how do you come back from that, Johnny? You know, you you got to believe in good. Um, you got to believe in unconditional love and you just have to have a focus on a whole bunch of other things because if you let that toxicity just stew inside of you and build and nurture and fester, sooner or later it's gonna spill out and you're gonna to be toxic. Um, I just knew there was something better and higher for me. And uh, I just continued to pursue and move forward. And you know, there's an old saying, the same people you see on the way up are the same people you see on the way down. And I've always believed in that. And so, yeah, it hurt. I'm not gonna say it didn't hurt because, you know, at the time I was newly married, you know, I had a young child, I purchased a, you know, a fairly expensive home. And that, that those uh, shares in the business that I was to receive would have gone a long way uh, to bridging that gap from the crash of the market to the, you know, to the, fun, the time where the market was back in a healthy position and I could have gotten back into it, maybe. But mm -hmm. all it's happened for a reason and I'm in a better place. So hindsight's 2020. 
I mean, what impact you mentioned your family a little bit in, you know, in this, in this time, in this particular instance of your kids or your child was young, but what about now with your family? I mean, how do you, how do you talk about this with the kids? You know, as you see stuff on TV and, you know, hear these things and, you know, I mean, how do you go about that? And do you have these kinds of conversations about what's happening out in the world and how to conduct yourself on what is that like? Well, you have to talk about it, Robin, because, you know, last that last time I checked, I've been a black man for most of my life. <laughs> and uh, long as I've known you. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. But uh, the reality of it is the existence of a African-American person in the United States over the last 50 years has changed for the better, understood. Yeah. But the experiences that my mom has shared with me, that my father has shared with me, grandmother and grandfathers, um, we learn that we, even though we may not be separate, we are not equal. And even though we're intermingled, we are not equal. Um, you know, just from the standpoint that, you know, I can uh, apply for a job and they may offer me a job and the salary that they offer me might be different from the salary they offer you. Um, just like the salary they offer a woman might be different from the salary they offer, they offer a man. It, we are in a world that uh, is not yet colorblind or genderly blind or or, or biased about sexuality. Unfortunately, the content of a man or a woman is not what's, what people are basing um, their perceptions about. And uh, as a black man, we know these, we, we understand this. It is changing, it is getting better, but I'm raising two young men of color. And you know they know if they're ever pulled over by a cop and they're you know, 15 and, and, and three, I mean, 15 and 12, respectively, they know how to act. Mm -hmm. I have to share that with them um, because I don't want them to be reaching and, and wind up in a morgue because the, 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 the law enforcement officer thought that they were reaching for a firearm. That is a reality. We all know that anybody, anybody of color understands we have a certain respect level that is 100% different um, than it would be of a man not of color or a woman not of color. And have I, have I've experienced that firsthand. Well, how do you bring God into the conversation, John? I mean, how, when you're having those kind of conversations. That's, 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 that's a very good question because we do go to church and we are very religious and we know that God makes everybody in their perfect image and likeness. And he made us in God's image and likeness. And that's where you have to start from, um, which means that God is, is colorless. So if there's a black God, a white God, a, a, a alleged brown God a, or a yellow God, it, it is a God and he is a loving God and, he, and we are made in his image and likeness. So that means God has all colors or no color, whichever one you wanna look at it. Um, I love being a black man, just like I'm sure you love being a white man. I love um, my Asian friends. I love my Latin friends. My boys have been blessed enough to be in situations where we are very diverse. And our friends that come over to the houses are, are very diverse. And so we always talk about you love that person for who he is and love what he looks like, even though it's different from you. And that allows for us to understand that, um, you know, it's just a part of that box of crayons. We are all just a box of crayons, you know, made in God's image and likeness, or, you know, a different box of chocolate. If you look at chocolate, you have white chocolate, you have dark chocolate, you have, you know, milk chocolate. All the chocolate's different colored, but we're still chocolate. We're still delicious and sweet. Yeah, well, I really appreciate that, and I, I certainly respect you immensely, and um, for for the the way in which you approach things, and how beautiful your family is, and how beautiful you are, my man. Appreciate. Keep up with Robin. 
<laughs> now, <laughs> Robin's a slow race compared to the man with the speed. Um, I don't know. <laughs> well, I know that you've had some challenges. Um, it certainly challenges when uh, 2007, 2008 hit. Um, um, I know that your world kind of went the other direction. Um, and, and you had to, you had to make some decisions in your life, in your life. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, you know, it's, when you're presenting with challenge, presented with challenges, you can let them consume you or you can, you can combat them and rise above them. And I'm not going to lie. They, they consume me for, I'd say a good year and a half, but you know, I, in retrospect, they're the best thing that could ever happen because I was able to recenter myself. I was able to find my core, what made me happy, what made me laugh, what was really the, the spark in my life. And I went back and I volunteered to share with other kids. I coached. Um, I, I gave of myself freely. I started getting back in church even more than I was before. Um, I made myself available for the blessings to come. And in that, uh, being able to, to help people, I found what I really enjoyed. Um, I found that I loved kids. I found that no matter how bad the situation was or appeared at the time and how earth shattering and all the rest of it, I always came out on the other side. Um, and that's, that's by God. There's no other way to say it for me. That was God's will. And he was, you know, we talk about, you know, trusting in him and allowing him to show, show you the way. Well, I call it the same, but I also develop what I call a, my spiritual ear. And I was able to start turning within and listening to the spiritual side of things. And I, I am not perfect. Please understand that. But I've gotten better and I've gotten able to trust that spiritual ear to allow me to come out on the other side. And, you know, there have been some times where I didn't know where I was going to put gas in my car or where the mortgage payment was going to come from. You know, I've been able to pick up the phone and call individuals that I love and respect. And they've, you know, been able to buy me a meal or, or do whatever, um, just out of the lovingness and the goodness of their hearts. And it helped me understand it, it, there is a way, there's a path, there's always a path. But you have to get out of the material space sometime and get into the spiritual space in order to find it. Because man in and of himself is a failure. So how did you make yourself, Sally has a question and she, she asked you, how did you make yourself available for blessings that were to come? Again, I had to turn within. I had to look at that, that the spiritual side of me, not the material side. The spiritual direction led me to where I needed to be. And I ran into a few walls. But if I hadn't taken that direction, I would not have gotten some of the opportunities or received some of the opportunities that came out of going that spiritual, that spiritual direction. I mean, I went to my, my kids' school. Um, they were in a private school at the time, and I started coaching and uh, met one of the parents there and they said, hey, you ought to look into this. And I looked into that, which turned into a dead end, but I met a couple of people that led me to another path that I ended up getting to where I am now. Um, but I, it all came from just spiritual understanding and grounding and listening, you know, because if I had kept running around, you know, myself and doing what I thought to be the right thing, um, inevitably, I'm sure I would have, failed again. And I still haven't gotten to a place that I, I would say I'm successful, but I am successful to this from the standpoint that I am much better listening and, and, and being a part of God's reality rather than, you know, the day-to-day -day reality. Because if, if we had to live in what goes on day-to-day, -day, I don't know how any of us would exist. You know, people, you know, being killed and murdered in the streets and people fighting over the right political party and the wrong political party. You know, um, it, it, there's a higher order that we all, I believe that we're all on this call at least, have to tap into. And with that, we will find that unconditional love for 
ourselves um, and humanity. And I think that will direct us in the right direction every time. So along your, in your journey here, how important has networking been? How, how, do, how do you view having conversations with different professionals and people that may not be in your, in your own um, particular industry? Uh, it's a great question, Robin. I have learned from, my, from our background, from my background, the best thing you could ever do is be willing to help somebody else. Not for a reward, just out of the kindness and the, and the, and the reward of helping and giving and sharing. Networking for me is an extension of that. I will always, always help somebody um, with somebody that I know, somebody that I, I love, that I care, or it just because it, it's going to help them benefit themselves. Um, I don't need a reward for that, but the, re the reality of it is when you do help somebody, you're blessed and your blessings come and we don't know how they do, they just do. And as far as networking, um, you talk to people with love and compassion and, and the genuine, genuine wanting to help them and it will happen. I guarantee it every time. Maybe not when you're expecting it. It may not come from the person you're expecting it from, but it always, always does. So I love networking because it's an extension of being able to do what I enjoy. I love talking to people. I love helping people. And I guess it kind of shows and it always comes back. It always comes back. Well, the top three takeaways um, we, we've got to get to here. Um, so tell us a little bit about why these three things? Well, you know, when you, when you have the platform of God in your life, it, it's bottom line is the foundation. You can't build a house on dirt or you can, but it's not going to stand very long. God is my foundation. And I think it, most of us on this call can agree with that. And if you don't go back and find God again, because that's, it, he wants us to find him. The lost lamb, come home, build that foundation, understand that he will provide. Everything you need is there with him. And for me, my family and my boys, we had to, we had to reestablish that foundation. Um, they say that the man is supposed to be the spiritual leader in the house. I don't know if that's true, but I had to go find my spiritual center and have to go back and get that. And from there, things started to change. Um, my sons, uh, you know, grew and were more settled. Um, my job, uh, they, they started to be a little bit more um, beneficial, at least financially beneficial. It helped me just understand that I am unable to do it by myself. It's thy will be done, as the book says, not my will. And those two letters make a big difference. And if you start living by that, by that credo, and you'll just see so many things just change and evolve and, and you just grow and you'll share uh, that unconditional sharing. Those blessings will pour out of that. And that's what God wants, I believe. I, want, I believe God wants to love each other. Yeah, I think he wants us to share his word and more so than verbally, show it through your life you lead. And I'm by far not perfect. I, I curse, you know, and I, and I'm loud and I act silly and I do all those things that would be believed or perceived as non-Christianly. But the core of me, most people that will see me will understand that I, I live and I love from the, from the heart and it's genuine. Um, and I think that's what the biggest thing that God wants us to do is love each other. And I do. Um, my family, my, my boys are an extension of me and I am trying to raise them in the best way I know possible. And that is loving and expressing love and, and, and giving love whenever they can. And yes, it's God cut you off on the freeway and you, oh, God bless you. No, come on. We all gone through that. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I think it is our job as family members, whether we be sons, daughters, uncles, aunts, 
moms and dads or children. Um, our family is, is, is the thing that we have to, to love so we can share with them what we want them to share with others, especially as a parent. Um, I don't get to be who I am if it weren't for my parents. Um, you know, and so what kind of hypocrite would I be if I didn't share that same kind of unconditional love with others? Because I love my parents, I like who I am, and I love my God, so I just have to follow that. So that's what it is. And every day becomes a new chapter, a new expression, a new opportunity to love and to grow and, and to express that. And sometimes it's hard. Because, you know, I don't know if any of you guys out there have, you know, lost a job recently with COVID or dealt with something that was earth shattering, the loss of a loved one or the, you know, where you've gotten a divorce or, you know, a breakup or lost, you know, anything, name it. Um, it is an opportunity to grow and to learn and, and to express love in a new way and to learn how to express it. And it's not easy, people. Life is not easy. However, if you continue to love, it becomes a lot easier. And, that, and that's, you know, that's what's worked for me. I can't say, I can't speak for anybody else, but I would, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you, try it. You know, when you're at rock bottom, you've got nothing else to lose. You know, try loving, try loving others. And in that you'll learn to love yourself and then watch everything unfold. It will happen, I guarantee it. Well, you're a loving man and you have a uh, we you have an opportunity with your firm. You've you've said, hey, anybody that needs a job <clears throat> down in, in my neck of the woods, I'm I'm happy to help. You guys have a hiring event. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing there. We are a company that uh, lends money to other companies for their equipment leasing or financing or business needs. It's that simple. I don't want to make it any more complicated. We help businesses grow. We help them grow financially by providing opportunities to get financing for equipment or let's just say monetary needs. And it's that simple. And anybody that's willing to roll up their sleeves and get a little dirty, a little grimy with some hard work will uh, benefit down the line. And it's typically a 30 day, I mean, excuse me, a three months process before you start seeing the, uh, the benefits. But after that, it, they come and uh, every day is a new day. It is a wonderful opportunity to make a, a nice living, but it's very hard work and you get to help a lot of people. So if you enjoy that, got a great place for you. Ah, we appreciate that, John. Um, I'm gonna launch our poll here. We're, we're right. the Good last day. section of our uh, kind of our wrap up and I promised you we'd be done here. Uh, we've kind of gone a little bit longer. Um, if there are any other questions or any of you have any comments, be sure that you have them, put them in the Q&A. Um, one one kind of last question, um, how do you, how do you um, I know that you lead a team of salespeople, how do you motivate them with all the things you've learned and in the challenges that you face and the adversity that you faced and and the things that are good and the bad and the ugly, what is it you've come to now to, to as you, as it, I'm sitting there and I'm a, I'm a newbie and I'm on your team. What are the things that you're leaning on to, to keep your team motivated and help them move through that hard work that you just described? Everybody is different. So you got to find out what their goals, what their, uh, their wishes and their aspirations are. Um, some guys are money motivated. Um, for me nowadays, and I was a money motivated guy, that is the least of the motivating factors that I deal with now. Um, others have, you know, they have, uh, let's say challenges at home and they need to pick up a financial um, slack to help their parents pay mortgages or, or rent or, or different things like that. Take care of a special needs child. Um, you just have to find out what each person, uh, their needs are. And then you just talk to them, man. And I and I failed miserably at times and will continue to fail motivating some people because I've diagnosed it improperly. However, 
they know that when I do talk to them about certain things because I'm sincere and genuine about my approach, um, I typically can get back on beam with them and help them get to the next level. But it's tough, man, it's tough. But once you get there, you see the repercussions of the hard work. It's, it's like making a good gumbo, it's delicious and it's wonderful to move. David um, says, thanks so much for speaking with us, John and Robin. John, could you speak a little bit more to moments when you've had doubts or had to work a little harder to find God? David, that's a great question. Um, I'll be honest with you, man. I've never had to work harder to find God. Um, there are times when I've been at a low that I have to go out and do the things that are necessary to bring myself closer. Um, what are those things? I mean, what do you have to do? I, well, first of all, and one of the things I, I will do is I, I, I listen to, you know, spiritual things in the car on the way to work and after work when I'm really having to dig in. I've gone to the reading room. I, it could be as simple as just cracking open the Bible and reading the Bible. For some, it might be the science, the science and health. Um, you just have to understand that it's a resource. And... Um, God is always so good, and we just forget it so often um, because of the day-to-day. -day. But once you kind of refocus and recenter yourself, I, I think you'd even say, Dave, David, that uh, this is there for you. And then you refresh yourself, and you just remind yourself of all the good things he's done. When he could have just dropped you on your hand and said, fend for yourself. And he hasn't. He's never done that. Well, I, I, I love it. I, and I think that, I think you hit the nail on the head right there. I, I can't imagine. Um, I, I, that's just the perfect answer. So if there, um, let me just see, it looks like someone else popped up. Let me just make sure. Um, thanks for your humility and perseverance. Example of listening and knowing love will and does provide. That's from Jackie. So I, I think um, everything we've talked about today, all the things that you've shared, John, are just right on. They're so wonderful, so humble, and so from the heart. And we just appreciate immensely your willingness to jump on here with us today. You know, I love you and I've always loved you and I've always appreciated you with my whole heart. So if for me, it's a treat to, to get to speak and have a conversation with one of my buddies. And But boy, what a treat it is for our community to have someone like you out there working and, and doing and being a part of what's happening. Um, this is the Albert Baker Fund, and if you have any questions about the programs that we offer, go to albertbakerfund.org and click the apply button, and the pop-down list will show you all the different things and the ways that we can help and the programs that we offer. We have so much on there. We have the, the ABF Career Alliance, which is what I am, um, at, at abfcareeralliance.org. Uh, for job seekers, students, and career allies, um, please take a look at that. There's incredible resources in this website, and there's a resource like this fella here um, that offers, we offer career connections and jobs and internships and externships and an online career course that's second to none, and the ability to connect with career allies like our good friend John here. Uh, and if you want to connect with John, we have a link right here and all you have to do is go to abfcareerlines.org, click on one of the tracks of students, career allies or job seekers and click this link and we'll help facilitate that connection um, as well. So be sure you like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, follow us on Instagram and connect with us on LinkedIn so that you can learn all the wonderful things that we're doing. I post jobs, post career connections regularly on our social media and we have great stories as well about our students. Thank you all for this wonderful, wonderful Brotherly Love campaign support. Our, our students are so grateful for how everyone has been expressing their love and supporting our students. Uh, we appreciate that wholeheartedly. Um, John, again, what a blessing you are, my friend. What an honor it is to call you friend and what an honor it is to have you a part of the organization supporting what we're doing. We so appreciate you being with her this week. Well, it's my pleasure. And I will say anybody that needs help any way I can, you just reach out, Robin. You know me. That's that's any anybody, anybody. We appreciate it so much. 
And if you have any questions, be sure that you reach out to me, Robin, at albertbakerfund.org. So this is the time we have to say goodbye and uh, say so long. So Mr. Butler, <laughs> go pick up those beautiful children of yours. Have a wonderful weekend. And everyone else have a wonderful weekend as well. And look forward to seeing you next week with our special guest from the Common Ground Committee, Eric Olson. It's going to be really fun. So again, adios and see y'all later. Thank you, Robin. See you, Talk Johnny. To you soon. Be good, Bye -bye. man.